Dan Tyre, welcome to the Modern Sales Management Show. Boom, Josh, I'm so excited. I'm your first guest, right? How does it feel to be the very first guest on the Modern Sales Management Podcast? It feels great. I'm super excited to be here. I'm super excited to speak to your audience. I'm super excited to do another Zoom. Actually, I'm not that excited about doing another Zoom, but for you, Josh, Paul, I'll do anything. Well, I'm super excited to be talking to you today. How long have we known each other, Dan? You know, that's a good question. I think it's uh, five or six years, right? Uh, first of all, you've been a solid contributor to the inbound ecosystem here in Phoenix for many, many years. We're on a highly successful um, uh, agency, which is uh, super fun. And then um, somewhere along the line, you took over responsibility for the Phoenix HubSpot user group. So uh, I've loaded lots of Costco snacks out of the back of your car at ASU uh, Skysong and brought them up three flights of steps and then um, helped you carry about half as many snacks out back down to your car at the end of the meetings for, I'm going to say, four or five years. So I, basically, I just never learned. That's what you're uh, no, that's not true. You always learn. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, I've seen you speak multiple times and you're awesome. You're the most humble person I know, right? Which complements my egotistical tendencies very, very nicely. Uh, second of all, I got the big energy and you're like super smart, right? My favorite Josh Paul memory. That wasn't even in the meeting notes. My favorite, you made me develop a bot in front of a hundred people. I'm like, I can't do that. You're like, sure you can, Dan. Let me show you. And I'm like, no, I can't do that. 20 minutes later, I developed my first chat bot. Oh, baby, that's the power of Josh Paul, right? You, and that's why I'm great. all in. Anything you need to do, happy to talk with sales leaders on the uh, Sales Manager and Leader podcast to explain my background and experience. Well, I'm really excited to have you here today. How did you, let's, you know, let's go back a few years. How did you first get involved in managing sales teams and being responsible for revenue growth? All right, so a couple of things. My first like sales management experience is um, I had to work my way through college, Colgate University, graduate 1980, uh, by selling books door to door. And as a sophomore in 1970, no, 1977, right, um, as a freshman, I sold as a salesperson. As a sophomore, I recruited uh, 10 people uh, to go sell books, dictionaries, door to door. I know I sound like your grandfather. Right. And we started upstate New York and went to Nashville, Tennessee, and then we sold in uh, Portland, Oregon. Uh, within 30 days, all 10 people quit, which was a great foundation for me to understand sales management. And uh, I wasn't off to the quickest start ever. My first professional position, right, was in my first startup, a computer reseller uh, based in San Jose, California. Uh, and uh, I was uh, one of the top salespeople for this company for a year. And then there was an opening uh, in Framingham. I worked in the back bay of Austin. There was an opening in Framingham. They asked if I would interview for it. Uh, and I said, sure. And it was a sales management position for a publicly traded company. Uh, and I moved from downtown Boston. I didn't even own a car. Back bay of Boston down to uh, Framingham, Massachusetts. And I got there and um, it was a mess. Right. And so I ended up uh, firing about half the sales team. Right. Uh, which proved to be very proficient in the first 60 days that we were there. We doubled revenue with half the employees and uh, my sales management career was uh, well underway. <laughs> wow. So how did you end up at HubSpot? So I've done five startups in the last 40 years. I know I sound like your grandfather. And whenever I do the intro about selling books door to door, like all the millennials are shaking their head and going, what? what? What's a dictionary? And it was before the internet. Actually, it was like 20 years before the internet. Um, but my first startup uh, went to $1.4 billion. I was working for a local computer reseller at the time in Boston. And my boss, Roger, Roger Lund, He's like, I'm moving to a startup. I'm like, what's a startup? He goes, it's a small company that's going to grow quickly. I'm like, all right, have a good time. He's going, no, 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 I want to bring you with me. I'm like, I got a job. He's got, I'll pay you $1,500 more a year. And I'm like, yeah, I'm a startup guy. Let's go. So I took the job, right? And it was amazing. I went from like being a small big fish in a small pond to like being one of the top salespeople of a nationwide company that like scale very, very quickly. Dave Norman, Enzo Terezi, Murray Dennis gave me my first start. 
A.J. McMillan, one of the uh, greatest uh, sales managers I've ever uh, worked with and worked for, and uh, worked in a variety of different areas in uh, Boston, in New York, in uh, Framingham, in L.A., in San Francisco, in Colorado, and uh, I fell in love with fast-growing startups. Uh, so I quit after 10 years. It was a great run. It was so much fun, and uh, started my own agency in um, my dining room in uh, Needham, Massachusetts. And over the next um, five years, I grew it to um, about a little less than $10 million. And uh, then uh, I got acquired by a Phoenix-based company in 1997. That's how I got to, um, to Phoenix. And uh, over 10 years with both of those combined companies, we went from zero to almost $30 million, six locations across North America. Uh, and it was an incredible culture. It was a very fast growing company. It was my second successful startup. Uh, then uh, I bought a training company and uh, worked it for two years and then had to put it into bankruptcy, which uh, taught me uh, business planning and humility. It was really, really hard. I thought it was going to scale like the other ones, and uh, it didn't, right? So uh, I learned a ton there. And then my fourth startup uh, got bought out by Microsoft. Um, I worked there for five years, worked for Microsoft for a year. And then um, turns out that uh, one of the co-founders of HubSpot, Brian Halligan, uh, was at that startup, Groove Networks. And when he started HubSpot, he called me up. He called me up and he said, we're starting this new company. We want you to join it. I'm like, I live in Arizona. Why do you, why do you want me to join? And he's like, you're a good salesperson. Software is not that good. We need a good salesperson. And I'm like, all right. So I jumped in and I worked for this guy, Mark Roberge, who was one of the greatest sales leaders I've ever had. Worked with him for seven years. Had one argument in seven years, Josh. Amazing. And uh, I am celebrating my 13th year anniversary at HubSpot this month. Right. I started as the first salesperson, then got promoted to the first sales manager, then the first sales director. And then I ran the international division. I um, was part of the leadership uh, team. I uh, did the sales training before Andrew Quinn, who's now in Arizona. Uh, I've done like lots of different jobs at Dubs, but I helped Pete Caputo start the partner program. And uh, now uh, 13 years later, I'm still fully employed by HubSpot with five jobs. And it's the crowning jewel of my 40 year business career. That's an awesome journey. Now, you have one of the greatest jobs at HubSpot right now. We, we don't have time to spend a lot of time on it, but you go around the world helping people. If, yeah, if, not anymore. Now I walk from my bedroom to my um, you, like you, um, office. You my, zoom around uh, the world. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you know, it's awesome. For, I work in the partner program for Katie Yang Mack, who's just an awesome, uh, strong leader for the HubSpot Solutions Partner Program. Uh, number two, I work for HubSpot for startups. That's my friend Kim Walsh and Amanda Sibley, right, um, supporting uh, about a thousand incubators and accelerators worldwide. Amazing. I helped start that program with Jonathan Sullivan and... Um, right, uh, with uh, a couple of different uh, folks back in 2010, and she's just revolutionized it um, over uh, the years. Uh, then I blog twice a month with uh, Lestranda Alfred, and she's my editor on the HubSpot sales blog, and uh, Meg Prater, who runs all the HubSpot blogs. Uh, and then I run a mentor program inside and outside of HubSpot at, at dantire.com. And uh, then I teach these boot camps where I teach people how to uh, engage and put more opportunities in the top of their funnel. So uh, I talk to entrepreneurs all the time, super fun, super impactful. When you teach a middle-aged person how to pick up the phone and call people in uh, 2020 and they actually do it and then they actually get business. They're like, oh my God, it worked. I'm like, yeah, unbelievable. And as you and I've talked about in the briefing meeting, Josh, lots have changed in the last two years, right? So we teach them modern methods of uh, engagement. So what are those shifts that you've seen in sales teams in the past two or three years? Yeah, it's amazing. In the old days, Right. I'm going to say uh, 1985 until uh, 2007. Right. Sales was the king of the universe. Right. If you were in marketing, you were a built in excuse. You were always in the doghouse. Right. And sales got all the glory, all the money, all the budget. And um, like if you wanted to grow your business, you hired somebody like me. Right. And I came in and hired field salespeople. Right. The marketing people played an important role. They do the brand and then they would um, develop the leads. But if the leads weren't closing, I would say it's marketing's fault. They don't give me good leads. Or if the, I wasn't closing business, I'm like, it's marketing's fault. I have too many leads, which is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. But it worked back then. Right. And uh, now we have sales and marketing alignment. 
right? If uh, I tell all the CEOs, senior sales leaders, right? If uh, you got more than 10 people in your uh, sales organization, right? Uh, take the two bottom performers, you fire them and give all the money to a uh, partner or give all the money to market. They're not gonna make it anyway. They're not really making their calls. They're just fudging it. They're not a good representative of your company and marketing need those leads uh, or at least that uh, budget to generate the leads. A uh, number two, I tell um, uh, salespeople, if you're not getting inbound leads, quit, right? Because for the first 30 years of my business career, right, I had to make my own leads. I had to generate my own leads, and that's hard. 90% of a salesperson's like time, effort, and uh, wasted energy is to identify good fit leads. And inbound leads, when they come to you, automatically uh, have a reason for talking to. And then marketers, if you're not practicing inbound, right, unless you're with Honeywell or American Express and millions of, uh, of contacts, you want to go to some place that's constantly replenishing their database. And about 27% of a uh, database will atrophy every year. So the ability to um, constantly refurbish your database with brand new leads is an important component of um, engagement. But a lot has changed and it just in the new normal in like 2020. Right now we lean into video email. You're, you've used video for, for the last two years, Paul, uh, Josh, it's been amazing. Every time I send a video email, whether it's prospecting or to some to an inbound lead, the first yeah. thing in their response is, is commenting on the video. Yeah, how did you do that? All right, so yeah, for the last two years, HubSpot has used video in our outreach and we teach video. Right, uh, I think only about uh, 12 to 15 percent of businesses are using video, but it's one of the biggest changes. Number two, the transition to inbound. Right, uh, I've been doing a lot of public speaking, and in fact, uh, I'm supposed to be in Brazil in about an hour, virtually, of course. Turns out the little virtual Dan Tire is almost as fun as the live Dan Tire. Right, it's a I'm a little tiny little guy on your Zoom. Right, but still got the big energy and jumping up and down. It's even more funny when you've got somebody translating it into Portuguese, because uh, the Portu the Brazilians have no idea what I'm saying half the time, right? But we talk about the move to inbound, and and as I've done my research on pandemics, pandemics usually last a little bit longer than people think about. There's usually like the second and third wave, right? And pandemics, the key business attributes, they accelerate business processes that are already in place. Right. And so like remote work. Right. It's like here to stay. Right. And people are understanding that impact on their face to face sales organization or this inbound thing. We've had the inbound sales methodology for four years. Right. And a, a handful of people stuck their toes in their water and have tried it. Right. But now the inbound sales methodology means you have to treat people like human beings. That means if you ever buy a list and send like your product description on the list. Right. Not only are you violating the can skin. The BAM Act, and not only are you violating GDPR um, like requirements, but no one will ever do business with you, right? You're just ruining your brand, right? And when you call somebody, right now, you want to define a very specific niche, either um, geographically or company size or vertical market. You heard me say this before: the riches are in the niches, and you want to make sure that you're calling on a very specific customer set, right? Because um, call, being a generalist in 2020. If you come up against somebody who specialized in this particular area, you'll always, you'll usually lose, right? Sometimes you can do it. Most people want somebody very specific that understands their vocabulary, their rhythms, their seasonality, the way that they engage with their customers, right? And then um, you want to help the first time you call. I see lots of sales organizations, they, they, they generate the inbound leads and the salespeople call up and say, is this a priority for you? Is this a budgeted purchase? Right. And if you ever say to Dan Tyre on the first call, is this a budget purpose? I'm like, goodbye. Right. And what people want is they want to, first of all, they want you to know, they want to know that you understand their situation. Number two, they want your advice on how to deal with the problem. Number three, they want help. Right. Josh, what do you want? You want somebody to push you or sell you, or do you want somebody to help you? So, how do you, raising it up a level, how do you, systematize and institutionalize those values and your ability for to capitalize on those trends and, and what the market wants at a sales team level yeah that's why i uh, i wrote this book inbound organization right um the um, culture needs to be very empathetic right uh, sales people are weird animals right in that um they're not particularly process oriented 
They're uh, all about doing what they think they need to do, right? And in the old days, like 2017, that worked, right? But they have a heightened sense of urgency because as a salesperson, if you don't hit your number two quarters in a row, you're gone. I don't care who you are, right? You could be Elon Musk. You miss your quarter twice, right? You're gone. So therefore, they're very skeptical of new ways of doing business. But uh, in 2014, I wrote this blog article called Always Be Closing is Dead, Always Be Helping right? That's the new sales motion, right? And it's been a highly uh, successful blog article. I published it on the HubSpot blog, uh, generated over 70,000 HubSpot leads and over 4,000 HubSpot customers, which I can thank Leslie Yee, who was my editor at the time, who did a great job of helping uh, me write it and promote it. And uh, so it's a little bit different in 2020. You have to have a little bit of a, 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 a wider, fly. you have to talk to a few more people. You have to tell them, no, 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 I just want to help you. You have to define if they're in just a awareness mode, consideration mode, or decision-making mode. And then you have to cycle in and say, no, 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 I only work with um, manufacturers in uh, Utah, Arizona, and California that are at least $3 million worth of revenue and want to grow 25% in 2020. Does that sound like you? Right. And if they do, then you engage. You say, how can I help? You explain what typically is the situation. And then you say, I am available for when you need me. Right. I have all of these resources at my beck and call. I can help you in a variety of different ways. I can educate you. I can provide you information. I can show you technology that will allow you to accelerate the process. I can turn you on to anything you need. What do you need? And the customer gets to decide. And the more you do that, it turns out the uh, more successful you'll be because in 2014, all the way to 2020, the, the uh, salespeople and companies that help, right, uh, are the ones that get the business. Because when people are in the decision-making mode, they're like, no, 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 that guy, Josh Paul, he helped me. He helped me build that chat pod. He helped me with my, um, uh, set my deal stages. He helped me set up my CRM. And uh, you've got a much better opportunity of uh, getting the ultimate deal. And when you have that process, some people say, no, that doesn't mean no, it just means not now. And over time, your reputation builds just like it has for you. So that if anybody needs help, it's just like why you're doing this podcast. If you can help educate some folks on the inbound process, then they're like, oh, this really works. It's always fun, Josh, because the first time somebody gets a lead that's never checked out their website and you're like, who is this? And they're like, I have no idea. I've never talked to this guy before. You're like, this inbound stuff is pretty good. And then when the first time the salesperson engages and uses an inbound playbook and says, hey, what were you uh, looking for help with? And the person says, wow, that's a great way to greet a prospect. Then all of a sudden it becomes a much different uh, scenario where you're the benefactor for all of the great stuff. Absolutely. My last company, we grew it using you know, from 10 leads a month to 300 leads a month using 100% inbound generated leads. and we would have salespeople come in. We had a small sales team for 300 leads. We'd have salespeople come in and say, what do you mean I don't need to, to cold call? Like these I leads know. just, and they would never, the salespeople would never leave because yeah. they don't want to yeah. go to an organization. Who would leave if you've got great opportunities that you talk to all the time? The other thing is uh, don't cold call. Anybody on this podcast, if you're cold calling, right, uh, stop. Because cold calling is uh, dopey in 2020. Uh, the average cold call returns about 1.26% into conversations. And uh, that means you're wasting 98.5% of your time, effort, and money. It's just not good, right? It also wrecks your brand. I got lots of stories about that. I want you to warm call. And warm calling is a little bit different. Number one, you define your ideal customer profile, right? Which is your niche, right? Number two, you do your personas. If you have any questions about personas, you talk to Josh Paul. He's an expert on personas. Number three, you teach your salespeople about those personas because they need to know it. Number four, when the salesperson calls, right, all they're going to do is ask how they can help, right? Then you're going to use video email. You're going to uh, research that person before you call. You're going to know where they are, what size company they are, how many people in their sales organization. You may not know exactly, but five minutes of research will turn uh, like a uh, like a cold call into a warm call where you're going to offer it out. And uh, in those scenarios, especially if you're calling four times over 12 days, you should get about, I don't know, a 30 to 40% response rate, right? Which uh, they won't all say no. Some people say not now, which is fine. But um, if you're using video and you contact them four times, 
right? Uh, only 7% of salespeople will uh, do four uh, attempts for outreach. That is, they'll call four times, email four times, leave four voicemails here in the United States. Some other places outside the United States, we don't leave voicemail. And uh, most salespeople stop at two, right? Two attempts. The problem is, if you ever want to get a hold of Dan Tire, it's probably the same thing with you, Josh, right? I didn't respond to your first email. When you send the second one, like, Dan, it wasn't that I didn't love you. It didn't want I didn't want to do the podcast. It's like I get 800 emails a day. You just get lost in my review folder. And then the second time, I'm like, oh, yeah, I promised Josh I'd do that. Boom. Next thing I know, we're right on this uh, podcast recording 20 or 30 minutes. Exactly. Exactly. This is, this is great. The, so the book is uh, The Inbound Organization. You co-authored it with Todd Hockenberry. Um, yeah. The book is about leadership and culture and people and values. But, but ultimately, it's a book about growing your business. It's a book about sales. Is that how you approached it? Uh, kind of. Uh, I was uh, speaking to the North American Association of Tool and Die in uh, Irvine, California. And I've known Todd Hockenberry, or the Todd Father, as I refer to him, uh, for 10 years. He was one of the first HubSpot um, partners. And he's a great guy. He's an industrial guy. He's got three patents in lasers or something like that. And I'm all big energy. I'm jumping up and down all the time. He's thoughtful. He's kind. He is logical. Uh, and, uh, we were both presenting at the, uh, conference and I'm like, he's like, what are you presenting on? I'm like, I'm talking about how sales and marketing aligns for an entire inbound organization. And he's like, oh, that's interesting. I'm talking about a similar topic. And I'm like, that's cool. He's like, we should write a book. I'm like, yeah, yeah. I'm a little busy. He's like, no, I'll help you write it. And I'm like, really? He's like, yeah. And I'm like, I thought about it for eight seconds and I'm like, okay, let's do it. And so we started getting together and over a year, we spent hundreds and hundreds of hours, right? We did our outline and about, um, I don't know, three months in, uh, the business publisher, Wiley, found out that we were writing a book and they said, um, are you writing a book? And we're like, yeah, we're writing a book on the inbound organization, the management philosophy of how you become an inbound organization. They're like, would you like Wiley to publish it? And I'm like, all right, what's like, what's behind that door? Why are you asking? Of course we would. And they're like, okay, this is what you need to do. You just need to finish in the next 90 days. So uh, Todd and I spent like 12 hours a day killing ourselves to get the book published. And we met our deadlines and it was super fun. And it's designed for people who don't quite get inbound yet. It, 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 it's like a HubSpot on like every other page. J.D. Sherman, Katie Burke, Brian Halligan wrote the uh, um the forward, Frank Osher, right? John Kelleher, who is our chief legal counsel, all these HubSpot executives talking about how we created a company that, by the way, the company's grown from zero to $700 million in the last um, 14 years. And at how you run a modern day company of 4,000 people selling software in 130 countries uh, by understanding what your mission is, who you serve, what your plays are, your targets, your omissions. And we just describe everything that we've learned dealing with end user customers, partners, and uh, working at HubSpot. And it was a pleasure to write. Now we go all over the world uh, lecturing, talking, uh, and getting people excited about the inbound organization. I mean, it's practical and it's inspiring. Everybody uh, it's so today. much. Fun. It, was, it was great. It was hard to write because I had never written a book before. Mm -hmm. I thought writing a book was just like talking. Writing a book is nothing like talking, right? I could talk for three hours on vanilla. Right. Uh, you send me three questions, uh, Josh, and you got to tell me whether this is a 20 minute podcast or a four hour podcast. Right. Believe me, conciseness is not a Dan Tire typical attribute. Right. Uh, writing a book, you have to like uh, have your major points. Then you have to understand where you're going to dig in all your diagrams, all your footnotes. It is a lot of hard, but it was great. We've gotten great feedback. Um, you can buy it on Amazon. You can buy it at inboundorganization.com. We have bulk purchases and uh, lots of people give it away every year to people who are trying to understand the inbound organization and the impact that um, an inbound organization has on their employees and partners and customers. So Dan, as you said, you travel around the world teaching about the inbound organization and sales and marketing. Uh, when you stop talking, what is the most common question you get? Uh, first of all, people say, what kind of coffee do you drink? <laughs> then they say, okay, is that big energy? Like, do you have that all the time? And uh, so the answer to the first question is two cups Guatemalan 
every morning at five o'clock. Second is I just woke up like this. About, I don't know, eight years ago, I gave up drinking in the United States. I do drink alcohol, but only in five foreign countries, right? Which is kind of quirky, but I'm kind of quirky. Uh, and once I gave up alcohol, my energy just doubled, tripled, right? So I always tell people I'm a 61-year-old millennial. Right. Because, uh, first of all, I think like a millennial, a socially responsible, uh, glued to my phone, have an attention span, maybe six to eight seconds. Right. Uh, and uh, I like to grind it out. Um, but I have all this like experience. So they ask uh, about that. And then they say, are you still do you still work for HubSpot? And I'm still uh, employed at HubSpot 60, 80 hours a week for the last 13 years. And uh, I'm to a certain extent. I, first of all, I love HubSpot right? Uh, their um, mission of growing better is synonymous with my mantra of trying to do the most good for the universe, right? Um, a lot of the things that I do, like the public speaking, I never would have been at this level without um, their help and support, right? I speak all over the world because uh, I, I'm speaking on behalf of uh, HubSpot based on all the things that I learned over the last 13 years. And uh, it's a uh, honor and a privilege to go everywhere in the world talking about this seismic shift in what every sales and marketing organization has to uh, do. This is what's going to happen in uh, 2020 as we all change, as we all adopt to the new normal, right? If you're not an inbound organization, right, you're going to face some real strong headwinds because we're not going to be able to do it the way we did it uh, before March of 2020. So if you embrace that shift, it can really give you a significant competitive advantage. But yeah, there's, there's no there's, question. There's a lot of companies that have trouble wrapping their arms around that idea in practical terms. So can you talk about what that looks like? Paint the picture with some examples of what an inbound organization might do differently. Yeah. So first of all, uh, most employees want to work for a mission driven company. Right. So you have to establish your mission. Right. We do a lot of consulting, Todd and I, where we'll go in and we'll ask the CEO, what's the mission? And he'll know. And we'll say, what percentage of your employees know the mission? And he'll say all of them. And then uh, we'll do a survey and we'll say, what's the mission? And 5% of them know. And they're like aghast. They're like, no, no, no. We talk about this all the time. And in reality, they don't. So we create what's called or help create what's called an M spot which is um, one of the hallmarks of uh, the last 10 years at HubSpot. And the M spot is your mission and then who you serve and your top uh, plays and your targets and your omissions for your entire organization. So everybody in the company understands what you stand for, who you serve, what you're trying to do, how you'll be judged and what you want to do, but you're just not going to do this year. And that M spot helps everybody stay on the same page. If you go to www.inboundorganization.com, you'll see an assessment of um, at where your organization is today, which it's free, anybody can take it. You'll also see a template for creating your first M spot. And if you submit the M spot, right, Todd and I will take a look at it and we'll give you our opinion on what you could do to improve it so you can be a mission-driven organization. Now that's, I'm so glad you explained that because it's one of the best tools that came out of the work that you put into that book. I knew it had been around before that, but you really brought it to the people. Yeah, it was fun. And we got uh, hundreds of people who have submitted their uh, M spots. And um, it's hard, right? Um, the Women's Leadership Council here in Phoenix was just going through and they're like, wow, these are tough questions. And I'm like, but they're important to ask, right? And they're like, oh, no, 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 they're important, but we don't know the answers. How do we get the answers? And I'm like, well, you got to sit with the senior leadership. You got to understand what you're trying to do. Then you have to define them right? Then there's a couple of iterations and then you publish it, but now you have it. Now everybody in the organization knows exactly what's like going to take place. So if I'm a CRO or a VP of sales or, or a sales manager, how do I apply the principles of an inbound organization to increase revenue? Yeah. So first of all, right, um, you've got to make sure that you have high empathy for your customers and for your salespeople, right? Uh, you asked me what some of the characteristics of good sales leaders in 2020. The first and most important is empathy. Number two, you should understand it is a little bit different, right? If you're qualifying on the connect call, forget about it. Every sales leader has to define your sales process. Should start with an inbound lead or uh, identifying an ideal customer profile that you can proactively reach out. And then on a connect call, you're just going to help. You're like, Josh, this is Dan from HubSpot. Thanks for picking up the phone. And then I'm going to say, Josh, what are you looking for help with? And you're like, what? I'm like, what, what can I help you with? And you're like, that's weird. 
what are you calling about? And I'm like, oh, Josh, I work with HubSpot agencies in Phoenix, right? Who have high quality retainers and want to grow their business 50 to 75% in 2020. Does that sound like you? And you're like, yeah, that sounds like me. I'm like, great. Tell me more about that. Now I'm just going to have a 10, 12 minute conversation about um, like you, you're going to talk. You're going to say all the things that you need help with. I'm going to, oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. After 10 minutes, I'm going to go, okay, we need to get into a discovery call because I have to jump into some uh, more specific question. And I interrupted you today. So let's, let's schedule it for tomorrow or the next day. The next phase of the inbound sales process is a discovery call where I ask you a bunch of questions. You tell me your experience and we diagnose what the problem is in a way that we can get you to understand, right? And we all get on the same page. And at that point, um, if there's a reason to move forward, right? The discovery call is the new close call. In the old days, you closed a deal. You don't do that anymore. Now you ask smart questions where if you're asking the right questions, the guy on the other side of the table should go, Ooh, that's a good question, right? And uh, it shows that you know the industry, you know the business. And then um, you can show them how you would solve the problem. And that uh, in the old days, when you closed a deal, you never saw your salesperson before. Now you check in periodically. So it's an ongoing uh, conversation. Um, that, that's great. Do you find that sales leaders and, and the people responsible for um, man, for driving sales teams, managing sales teams, are able to convey that the, those values in that process? What are the biggest pitfalls that they run into? Yeah, sometimes the old guys, the experienced salespeople, like now nah, they don't like that's not the right way to do it. I used to do it this way, and in reality, introverts, you're a better salesperson than I am, Josh right? Because you've got better listening skills. No, it's true, right? You cycle in and anybody who talks with you, you're a delayed processor. I ask you a question, you actually think about it, right? When you ask me a question, I'm answering it before you finish the question, right? And people don't like that in their salesperson. So I got to, when I'm uh, selling, not doing podcasting or public speaking, I got to ratchet it way down, right? I've got to ask insightful questions. I got to press the mute button, and uh, women make better salespeople than men, I think, because they're more empathetic. Um, introverts make better salespeople because they listen better. Detail-oriented people are super important. It's not about relationships, taking people to golf, taking them to lunch. It's about how you can add value to their specific situation. And I think that goes a long way to defining a sales organization and pointing to it. So if people can't modify. The other thing is, like, there's so many changes just in the last two years. Right in this boot camp I teach, we go through different uh, curriculum, like frequently, right? And so if you're just doing the same thing that you've done for the last 30 years, it's not going to work, right? And uh, it'll come out one way or the other, right? You'll either not be able to hit your number anymore. It'll just stop, right? Or you'll have to move to plan B, right? And uh, so we find younger salespeople, right, that uh, are more open to the new techniques, uh, really, um, it resonates a lot more with them. And that's a really important role for uh, people in sales management. Yeah, they so, got to recognize that. Uh, also believe in diversity and inclusion, right? Especially uh, with what's going on in the um, United States today, right? Uh, HubSpot and Dan Tyers stand uh, against injustice and racism and stand with the black community, right? Um, having hired a lot of people from uh, at HubSpot, I didn't have the emphasis on diversity and inclusion that I should have. And now we do. It's now on our M spot, right? And I think creating a diverse um, sales organization makes a huge difference. If you're going to sell to women, you have to have women salespeople. If you're going to sell to the black community, you need to have black salespeople, right? And uh, that's just uh, a reflection of both what's going on in society today is uh, good sales practices. Those are really important points. So this has been a masterclass in sales management in 2020. I Really appreciate this conversation. Where can listeners find you online? And can you tell them again where they can get a copy of the Inbound Organization or learn about it? Yeah, it's uh, the book is on Amazon. You can go to www.dantire.com. You can go to um, find me on LinkedIn, right? I'm pretty easy to find, right? And uh, I make my schedule available because I like helping people, right? Doing the most good for the universe means for everybody. Right. So I'm pretty booked a lot. But as long as you don't mind like scheduling, I'm happy to cycle in. Right. The inbound organization uh, dot com is the book. 
DanTire.com is my personal speaking of blog articles and uh, focus. And uh, you can Google Dan Tired HubSpot. You'll see a lot of my HubSpot uh, contributions. Well, thank you, Dan Tire. I will include a link to Dan and Todd's book in the show notes. And it's a really important read. Even if your company doesn't think of itself as a traditional inbound marketing organization, in, the inbound philosophy has shifted and the entire organization, you can optimize your entire organization for today's buyers following the advice in Dan's book. Dan, do you have any final sales management advice for our listeners? Uh, it's a little different in 2020, right? Make sure you have good people. Make sure they're well-trained. Make sure that uh, you have high trust and always hit your number. <laughs> always hit your number. All right, Josh, great to see you. I got to jump. I got to go to Brazil virtually. Uh, but thanks for inviting me on your podcast. Happy to do another one sometime in the future. And um, I'll uh, look to see you soon. And that does it for this episode of the Modern Sales Management Podcast. Thanks for listening.